بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بار الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله وحبيبه أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى يوم الدين السلام عليك يا بعبد الله وعلى الله التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله يا بدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters uh, today I'd like to uh, talk about the topic of conceit, self-conceit, or you could interpret it, you could interpret it as a form of arrogance or pride. And why I want to cover this, because in uh, one of, in the letter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam to his brother Muhammad Hanafiya, uh, al Hanafiya. Uh, detailing why he is rising up. He says, Inilam akhroj asheran wala batheran. Meaning, I did not go to fight out of self-conceit or arrogance. I didn't go to fight thinking I was better than anybody else, even though he was. It's not the reason he came out to fight. And so this is one of the first things that he de details about an inward state in, his, in, in the self, about why he rose up. It wasn't for this reason. You know, um, many times our actions, we explain our actions by one of two means, or both. You know, one means is an external necessity, why you do something. You know, there's a need for you to do something. Uh, there is a responsibility, you, are, you have to do something. There's some kind of event or some kind of situation outside that uh, requires your input or your effort. And the other reason why you do something, and this is the more superior reason, is because of an inward state. It's because of your own internal self. You know, so if your internal self is negative, that would be the negative motivation for doing something on the outside. You know, for example, uh, I want to go to university. Okay, this is an outward, uh, an action that you want to do. Okay, there's a university out there, I want to go to university. Uh, I want to go to university because I want to be an engineer and I think uh, being an engineer will help empower my country, for example. This is an outward reason. The inward reason could be something entirely different. The inward reason is I want to be an engineer so I could make money, so I can get the, buy a Porsche, you know, and I could look really fly in front of everybody else. Everybody be respect me and, and so forth and so on. That's an inward type of thing. Or I want to be an engineer because um, this is a, cap a, cap a capacity I have. I'm really good with math. Um, and I really like being helpful, an inward state. Uh, many times, many, many times, we fool ourselves. Sometimes we have a negative uh, internal motivation. And when I say negative, I mean an, it's not a good reason. And uh, sometimes we cannot bear to admit that we are seeking glory, or we are seeking respect, or we are seeking uh, prominence in society, and so forth. So I say, yes, I'm going to study medicine because I want to help people. But basically, I would like that DR in front of my name. It sounds really cool, and everybody is going to be respecting me. And so Imam Hussein alayhi salam first starts off with this this description of an internal state because the internal state is basically what defines the reasons behind your action 
And the first internal state he's talking about is arrogance or pride. And this arrogance or pride is extremely important because when we look at Islamic history, the, the spiritual history of Islam, we realize that the first person who was arrogant was who? The shaitan. The shaitan was the first person who was arrogant. He thought himself as superior to Adam. And he did not want to bow down to Adam because of this. And this is why Allah kicked him out of paradise. Uh, on a side, it also talks to us about the uh, existence of evil. Does evil exist or does it not in a real sense? Because evil can be described as the absence of good. This is what evil is, the absence of good. And because, most, and because it's a negative thing, for example, let's look at an evil like uh, ignorance. What is ignorance? Ignorance is a lack of knowledge. It is not the presence of non-knowledge. It's like darkness. Is darkness uh, something that is uh, real in its essence? Does darkness exist as an essential reality? No, it does not. Darkness is the absence of light. The rule, the universal rule is light. Everything is light. Everything is illuminated. It is when that light is not there that you find darkness. Here right now we have light. You turn the light off, darkness sort of almost comes into existence. But it's an absence of something. Cruelty, for example. Cruelty is the absence of mercy. That's cruelty. And so most of the philosophers say that uh, uh, evil is a negative thing. And this is a very important point. Because there's a very interesting question people ask, which is, if God is so good, why is there evil in the world? If God is so good, why is there evil in the world? The answer, and, and did God create evil? Because if God created evil, then he's a source of evil. The answer is no. Evil is, really comes along with creation. Evil is the, the shadow around creation. Okay, the shadow around creation, the limits around creation. God created beauty. The limits of beauty is what we would call ugliness. God created mercy. The limits of mercy is what we call non-mercy or uh, maybe cruelty, which is in the case of a, a conscious being, of course. All right. So in a sense, uh, evil is the limitation of things because these things are not perfect like God. God is the only perfect being, completely perfect being, that has no evil in himself. But because something is not God, and it has a limitation in its own positivity, that limitation itself is what we would call evil. That type of evil is what we call ontological evil. Sorry to bring up the big words, ontological evil. Ontological or ontology means dealing with existence. Dealing with existence, okay? This Let's call it a glass. This cla glass exists. There's an ontological limitation to this glass. It's not a microphone. It's not a, it's not a chair. So if you try to sit on this, it would not support your weight. You will fall. You would call this evil because it's terrible. I fell because I tried to sit on a glass and it didn't hold my weight. You see what I'm saying? So the limitation of this thing is what we would call evil. And therefore it's clear that ontological evil is not really something that um, is a moral issue. Is that really something that is a moral issue? We have no problem by, with this glass not being a chair. We have no problem with, with it at all. Then there's another type of evil. And this is a type of evil that actually can exist. But it needs a cause. It needs a medium. That is moral evil. That, is a, that, is, that, that comes from a, from a being that has three important characteristics in order for that evil to come into existence. That being must first of all have an intellect, okay? An intellect which is fundamentally the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. That's what an intellect is, fundamentally. There are other aspects of the intellect, but we'll go into that. Fundamentally, intellect is the ability to distinguish right from wrong. A being must have an intellect. 
And so, um, animals cannot do evil, really, because they do not have an intellect like that. Uh, secondly, that being must have uh, what we would call uh, shahwa. It must have desires, okay? It must have passions. And for that being to have that, it must have a body, okay? It must have a body. Because the body is where you get your desires. If you think about all the desires you have, they go back to your bodily needs, your physical needs. And when we say bodily, we don't necessarily mean a flesh and blood body. It could also mean a subtle but material body, like the body of a jinn. So a jinn is made up of what? Smokeless fire. That is pure energy. And as most of, the, of you here who are into, into uh, science know, that energy and matter are basically one and the same thing. Bismillah. Basically one and the same thing. Ma uh, matter is in a sense a kind of a, 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 a conglomeration or coagulation of energy, of, of the reduction of energy to a, a physical type of thing. Very much similar to, for example, uh, water vapor, uh, uh, water, and, uh, and, and ice, for example. Okay, so matter and energy are fluid. So shaitan or the, the, the jinns, they have a body. So you have these two things, the, an intellect and a body. A body from which you get your shahwa. Your shahwa for the opposite sex, your shahwa for wealth, your shahwa for, for in, in, in extending your life, your shahwa for food, whatever it might be, okay? And even, even uh, social status is part of that because you're living with other bodies and you have a particular system. And the third thing that being must have is a will. A will. And why must that being have a will? Because that being acts in the direction of the thing that it's attracted to. That will operates in this way. That being, when it is confronted with something, say for example, I, the body is hungry, so I have need, I have a shahwa for food, okay? I have a choice. I can either work to get an income to buy food, or I could walk past a store, a, a, a department store, I see them selling food and I can take the food away by, by, by force or by stealth. This is the choice we have to make. And so if we do not put our desires, our shahwa, under the control of the intellect, we make choices that are what we would call evil. We would make choices that would infringe, for example, upon the rights of other people. And this is what we call moral evil. So you have that will to make that choice, and then you carry out that choice by that will in terms of moving in, your direct, in that particular direction. Now, how does the evil come from such a being? Well, a being, for example, if it is thinking in such a way that it excludes the intellect from the equation, it uses what we would call a pseudo-intellect. A pseudo-intellect, which is what we, would, what we called um, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, but it's a different type of um, uh, wahama. It's called wahama, okay? And you find in, 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 in uh, uh, contemporary psychology, uh, they, have a, they don't really talk about wahama, okay? Wahama is a type of imagination that comes into the mind. And remember, the mind has different levels, okay? Uh, the, some of the, of, the, of the scholars say the mind uh, is related to the body, is, to, is related to the soul, okay? Whereas the intellect is something more, far superior. The intellect is connected with a human being, is related to a human being, but it is not the product of a human, of a human interaction, okay? Now, I'll give you an example of what Waham is like. Let's say, for example, um, I am hungry. I'm on, and I'm, on, I'm on my way home to eat. What happens to me is I imagine the food in my mind. 
You know, my mom calls me and says, I cooked you something really nice. You love it, your favorite food, all right? I go home, I'm my, on my way home, I'm thinking about this food, I'm imagining this food, and so forth and so on, all right? Until a point is reached, when I, is reached right, when I get to the food, I am really craving that particular food. That's a kind of a wham. Huh? Or for example, uh, I have a great desire for something. The desire is always present in my, in my mind and I develop in my mind a type of psychological justification for this. This is the psyche. All right? This is what we call the nafs. The nafs on that particular type of level. And sometimes we confuse ourselves between the uh, waham and the intellect. And now, so you have a, a situation where a person, or sometimes, in, in, in this case, a class of people who share the same shahwa and share the same waham. And out of that waham, out of that pseudo-intellect, they develop a system that justifies this. I think you know what I mean. When you meet somebody who always does wrong things, if you notice, they have a reasoning behind it. They have a worldview sort of behind it that justifies that particular action. And that machinery in the mind creates an outward reality. Like, for example, laws, if they come to power, for example. You know, laws and rules and, and a system, what you might call an ideology, in order to satisfy this particular uh, desire that they have. And a good example of this would be all of the uh, uh, oppressive systems that we have seen in the world, like Nazism or apartheid um, or, or, or Zionism and things like that. They come from a negative point of view, you see? Why is it, for example, that in Europe, and in Western countries, they all talk about the rights of refugees. They all talk about the rights of refugees to go back to their country. But when it comes to Palestinians, they just can't comprehend the extension of that reality to them. Why? Because this is, they created a system that excludes that particular type of reasoning. Because that is not intellectual. It is wahmi. And when you create that particular system, what happens is a natural human tendency is to live in conformity with that particular system. So you found that, for example, in Nazi Germany, even Ger we cannot say that German people are bad, but the majority of German people actually supported Nazi ideology, actually supported it. You know, if you look at for Israel, for example, today, you'd find that an Israeli um, would be non-racist, in America, but be racist in Israel. Okay, how is that possible? Because it's a, it's a system that when you enter it, when you enter that system, you tend to fall in conformity with that particular system. You know, I mean, I, for example, you know, uh, uh, I remember in Iran, you know, there was a lot of uh, Afghani refugees, and many of, because these countries are not as uh, I guess, advanced uh, economically speaking, to be able to integrate them into the economy and so forth, you'd find that many of these people tending to, uh, to work in menial jobs. They would tend to be, you know, people who are digging the streets and, you know, serving tea and so forth and so on, till that system becomes one where people sort of conform their minds to it. So they'd ask me, you know, Hanif, you know, uh, uh, you're from Canada. Are there Afghanis in Canada? I say, yeah, there are Afghanis in Canada. What do they do? You know, do they do the same thing? Do they serve tea and dig the ground and so forth and so on? I tell them no. Right? I try to counteract uh, their racism. I tell them the majority of them are professors in universities. But it's true, a lot of them are not people who dig the ground and serve tea and so forth. But if you're there and you see this all the time, all the time, then you start developing what? A wahmi understanding, a false understanding, which is what we call stereotyping. Okay? So for example, in these countries, Gulf countries, for example, you see the majority of people who uh, serve tea and 
uh, serve you in the house and so forth, tending to be people from Bangladesh and the subcontinent and so forth and so on, right? After a while, you develop an idea that naturally these people are like that. Where is that coming from? Is it coming from the intellect? No. Is that coming from the intellect? It's coming from the waham. And that waham maintains that particular outward uh, state of affairs till that state of affairs becomes, becomes something concrete. And here you have now evil existing as a particular reality in the world. So it's only, only a being who has an intellect, who has uh, a body and shahwa, and who has a will to orient itself one way or the other. It's only a being like that that can create an outward system of evil. Yes, salawat to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his family. Oh. Now you see where, for example, arrogance comes in. Where arrogance comes in. Arrogance and self-conceit come from a place where you have a certain outward appearance of inequality between people. And that person who has that uh, advantage in that particular situation sees him or herself as superior to the other person. Maybe absolutely, maybe relatively. They see themselves as somebody above that particular person. And it's very clear. This is the same, the same situation with, with Shaitan. Before Hazrat Adam, Shaitan was quite all right. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't a bad guy. It is only after uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and said that this man is going to be in charge. Imagine, for example, it's something like this. Imagine you're working in a job all the time because they said, you know, Iblis, um, in, uh, before the appearance of Adam, you had basically a jinn civilization that, was, that was, was ruling, you know, and that he was... So, so spiritual, and I like this idea. I really like this idea. Shaitan was a sheikh. He's a sheikh like me. Okay? He wasn't an atheist. I, I so love this idea. <laughs> because it would be so easy to understand Shaitan as an atheist. Well, he doesn't believe in God. You know what I mean? But Shaitan believed in God. God spoke with him. He was better, better than us. You know? God spoke with him. Shaitan, why did you, why did you bow down? Well, you know, I, you know, right? He was, he was, he was a, a Rouhani. Okay? He was a very religious guy. They say Shaitan worshipped God for 6,000 years. 6,000 years. To the extent that all the jinn said, oh, there's nobody as good a marjai taklid like Shaitan. I'm just throwing that out for you. Right? There's nobody a good waliullah like Shaitan, like Iblis. But in that there was a certain pride. There was a certain pride. And it is said in some books that uh, he worshipped God so reverently that the angels in the heaven above this world were so impressed by him, they asked for him to be brought up among them. They'd be so honored by his presence among them and he was brought up on that level. And he outdid the angels in worship. So don't think that because you're Shia and you're praying and you're fasting, you're out of the woods. You're not. And it went up and up and up like that. But God no knew what was, in his, what was in his mind. And so Allah creates this being. This being who outwardly is inferior to shaitan. And it's very interesting. I just love this too. Adam also means very dark, <laughs> very brown. All right? And Shaitan was light, smokeless fire, brilliant light. There was nothing dark about Shaitan at all in his body. I love it. And so God says to the angels and so on, you know the story, uh, this person is going to be in charge. He's my Khalifa. And now imagine you're on the job and you're working and you're trying to move up and you're getting promoted. And just before you reach the level of, let's say, I don't know, uh, a vice president of the company or whatever, they bring in some, let's say you might be 40 years old or something, you know, worked hard, you got all your degrees and all of that. You know, the boss brings in somebody better than you, but he didn't do much study. 
and uh, you know he's he's much younger, all right, and not maybe not even as good looking. And you wonder and you say to yourself, how come I don't like this? I put all my efforts. I know you're gonna put this guy in charge of me. No way. Pride, pride, pride only comes out when you can compare yourself to somebody else. And this is where he fell. And so what Imam Hussein alayhi salam is saying is I, got no, I have no shaitan yet in me. I have no shaitan in me. When Imam Hussein says, alayhi salam says, that a man might, like me will never give allegiance to someone like him. He is speaking objectively. He is not speaking subjectively. He's speaking objectively. A person like me, not me, a person like me can never or will never do this. This is what it means. This is not a statement of arrogance. It is, it's a statement of objective fact. And he rises up based upon that objective fact. That is why he says he did not rise up out of arrogance or self-conceit. Because the more just has the right over the less just. The more pious has a right over the less pious. The more spiritual has a right over the less spiritual in terms of domination, in terms of control, in terms of power. And so Imam is saying the first thing that is necessary for us to walk in the path of Allah is to eliminate arrogance from our hearts. Now, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says that the reason why a person is arrogant is, is because they have an, a deficiency in them. They have an inferiority complex. When you see somebody who thinks that they're better than somebody else, and they revel in that, it is because they have some kind of problem. And this is a very profound thing. Why is this? It is because this inferiority complex that you have, this deficiency that you think you have, leads you to try to compensate for it by trying to be an overlord over the other person. Take, for example, a class bully, all right, or somebody who is a bully, period. You find that a lot of like, young kids who are bullies in, in, on, the, on the, the playground or in school are kids who are actually being bullied by one of their parents. Are kids whose, whose father or mother or something belittles them at home. And because they have this problem, because they want to compensate for it, they want to eliminate it, they compensate for it by uh, bullying somebody else, trying to belittle somebody else, okay? This is why, for example, uh, uh, it is not encouraged for us to act arrogantly, but it is encouraged for us to act arrogantly with the arrogant. It is encouraged for us to act arrogantly with the arrogant. Not being arrogant, but act arrogantly towards them. Why? Because if you act with humility towards them, it feeds that arrogance. Because humility is down. Humility is in the valley. Humility is something, is, is, is tawadho. You know, it is, it is making yourself haqir. It's making yourself small with respect to other people. But to the arrogant person, you feed him. You actually justify that arrogance. And this is why, for example, it is very important for you to treat them the same way. And this is why you find, for example, in that battle of Karbala, you find that some of the soldiers uh, respond, the, 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 the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, respond to the, the, the forces of Yazid with an apparent arrogance. You know, you ain't nothing. You know, I'm everything, and that type of thing, because you're actually fighting that arrogance in their soul. 
A lot of, for example, spousal abuse, men abusing wives, okay? It comes from a man either coming from a family where his father was not someone who pulled his weight with respect to his mother, for example, okay? It could, become, it could come from a, per, a man who had been actually bullied by his father or bullied by his mother, okay? And he wants to take it out on his wife, all right? It comes from a man who has some kind of inferiority complex in himself that requires him to try to take it out under somebody who is under his dominion. And so, when we are confronted with a loved one who is treating us in this way, it, does, it is not enough for us to confront that particular act just on the surface of the act itself. You have to go below. You have to find out what is the, 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 the weak point, the weak nature of that person that they had this particular feeling. And this requires communication. It requires communication and to work to help them uh, solve that. And if you or me, we find ourselves acting in the same type of arrogant way, we also have to ask ourselves, really do some serious introspection and say to ourselves, why? Why am I behaving like this? What is it about myself? What has happened to me in my past, in my uh, upbringing, in my growth in life that makes me this way? And you will find the answer if you're really honest with yourself. And once you find that answer, you would be able to cure that particular um, problem. And if that husband, I say husbands quite a lot, uh, more so than wives, but there are wives who also bully their husbands as well. Um, if that answer uh, cannot be found by the perpetrator of that, then that person needs the help of their spouse or of a therapist or something like that to be able to conquer that particular feeling. Give salawat to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his family. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, learn something from what Allah did to Iblis. He made his long duration of good deeds and his hard work 6,000 years. It's not a joke. Futile. He made it all go to waste. Nothing. Because of an arrogance that lasted only one instant. So, after Iblis, who could be saved from this sin? Who could be saved from this sin? He shows us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us how he detests arrogance. And so we should never have any arrogance to anybody in our society. Yes, we could acknowledge our advantage, but what is our advantage? How do we deal with our advantage? We deal with our advantage through kindness. We deal with our advantage through being uh, uh, of service to other people and to Allah's creation. This is how we deal with our advantages. Because we know that we weren't born like this. We acquired this. We went to school for this. You know, Allah made the, uh, the, 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 the conditions for us to be somebody or to be something. He made the conditions for us to be of sound mind and sound body so we should, we should be able to, to, to find something that he has put there for us to improve ourselves. And then we take this, we take this gift that he has given you and then you stand up there and you start saying I'm better than this one and I'm, I'm superior to this one and you want to lord yourself over others. He didn't give that to you for this. That's why he's so angry with you. He gave it to you to spend in his way. He gave it to you to help other people. He gave it to you to be able to make other people feel better and to take their hand and lift them up just like you were lifted up and he will give you more when you do that. But when you take it and you keep it for yourself, that's a stinginess. And then you want to, you know, uh, lord yourself over other people. This is a sin and Allah would punish you for this. May Allah protect us from arrogance. Arrogance is the flip side of jealousy. It's the flip side of jealousy. With jealousy, 
you think you don't have what somebody has that is better than yours, than what you do. And you think, this is how, how Akhlaq defines jealousy. You think that what that person has, they don't deserve it. It, it should be you who should have it. Okay? It should be you who should have it. And so, you hate that person for it. This is jealousy. It's the same as arrogance in a sense. Only with arrogance, you have it. With jealousy, you think you should have it. You believe it's yours. And you do not like the person who, assalamu alaikum, who, who, who has it. Hmm? This is very different from ribta. You know, from admiring somebody for having something. That's a quite a different thing. You know, somebody has achieved something, somebody has something. You like it for them. You like it for them. Alhamdulillah, I love that. It's so great. You know, I love that. Look at you, you're so handsome. More handsome than me. Great for you. You see? Or you have a good job or whatever. All right? That's not jealousy. Okay? Jealousy is when you hate somebody, you dislike somebody for having something. And so we have hadith that speak about arrogance almost in the same way as they speak of jealousy. It says jealousy uh, consumes our good deeds like uh, a fire consumes wood. It says the same thing about arrogance. Arrogance con uh, 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 consumes our good deeds just as fire consumes wood. So arrogance is a very, very evil thing. One of the descriptions of the arrogant person is that the arrogant person is not intelligent. In fact, the, the arrogant person is, is, is called stupid. An arrogant person is called stupid. And it says that arrogance is like a, a tall hill, a tall mountain, whose top whose summit is uh, made of, of uh, rock. And when the rains fall, it flows from those rocks. It doesn't sink into those rocks, but they flow down into the valley. And it is in the valley that the vegetation grows and the rain uh, 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 you know, manifests itself as uh, something to water the plants and so forth. That rain, is the, in the intellect. That rain is the knowledge, is the goodness that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the arrogant person, because they are arrogant, cannot absorb that. Because to be able to absorb knowledge, to be able to absorb knowledge requires a level of humility. And when I say knowledge, I don't just simply mean knowledge, you know, going to school or university and so on. No. I mean knowledge of the world, knowledge of life, knowledge of your environment, your surroundings, and so forth and so on. For example, if I'm an arrogant person, I would not be able to distinguish between people in this crowd, for example, who can help me, who could have a, who, who, who in, a, in, in five minutes of a conversation, I could learn something from them. I could learn something about myself. It doesn't matter who that person is. It could be the chaiwala or the, the tea man. It could be, it could be the, the taxi driver. It could be a big sheikh. It could be a university professor or a humble a primary school teacher. You don't know where you're going to get your knowledge from. Allah speaks to us in this way. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us through our environment. And if you're humble enough, you'll be able to see. And you could, you could know that Allah is talking to you because you're thinking about a problem. And then you hear somebody say something just, just off the cuff, by the way. And your heart says, yes, this is the answer right there. That person didn't even know what they said. But you... Because you are humble, you are able to pick that up. An arrogant person can't pick that up. Because an arrogant person is saying, I'm better than him. I'm better than him. He should be bowing down to me. There's no reason, there's no need for me to listen to that particular person. And so that person is stuck upon that level. You know, they might have had much more of an education than you. They might have had, a, they might be you know, teaching a university course for example. But what the knowledge they have is not a dynamic knowledge. Okay? It is facts. It's facts. It's information. Information that they could regurgitate at any time. You see, because knowledge 
is something that changes your being. Knowledge is, knowledge is something that feeds your intellect. Knowledge is something that uh, gives a glow to your soul. This is knowledge. Knowledge is something that is absorbed by your very psyche and your heart. And so you are able to uh, live that knowledge. Knowledge is the food of the soul. That soul that is arrogant does not have that food. That arrogant soul, what it wants is worship. It wants somebody to acknowledge its superiority. And if it doesn't get that, it is very angry. It is very upsetting, like shaitan. For example, give salawat to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his family. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, Imam al Baqir is quoted to have said, If any amount of arrogance enters the heart of a person, it will only bring deficiency to the intellect of the same amount as what entered it. If there is any amount of arrogance that enters the heart of a person, it compromises your intellect to the same extent of the arrogance that enters your heart. Regardless of that arrogance being a little or a lot. When I'm saying this, I'm not just saying this as an objective thing, I'm saying this as subjective. All of us, all of us have a certain level of shaitaniyat in our being. All of us. Right? All of us, therefore, have a certain level of arrogance on some level that we practice. We should do what is called muhasaba. Muhasaba means taking account of yourself at the end of every day. Taking account of yourself at the end of every day. So you sit down before you go to bed and you think about your day and you ask yourself, have I been arrogant to people? Not necessarily outwardly. Huh? You know, you could be arrogant to somebody and they have absolutely no idea that you're arrogant. You know, you could smile with them, you know, you could, you could, you could be, you could be, you could pretend to be humble with them, you could pretend to listen to them, you know, right? You could pretend to be so cool that everybody likes you and stuff like that, but you think you're better than everybody else. You have to examine yourself and you have to ask yourself, am I arrogant? Have I been arrogant today? And detect that. Really examine yourself in your relationships with people and how you think about people. And you ask Allah for forgiveness for that. And you stay on guard. You stay on guard for it the next time it comes around. Because a lot of this arrogant type of behavior have patterns. Okay, You might be arrogant to a particular person or persons. You might be arrogant to a particular kind of people. You might be arrogant with respect to a particular subject. You might be arrogant with respect to people in certain occasions. You have to pick out the patterns and you have to be able to examine yourself. This is what we call the Jihad al-Akbar. Okay? What you are searching for, what you are searching for is your shimri arrogance. Your, your Ibn Ziyadi arrogance, you know, your Yazidi arrogance. And you should unsheath the sword of an Abbas inside yourself or a Hussein inside yourself and wage war on this particular arrogance. And this is something that might take your entire life. It's not a one-shot deal. But inshallah, Allah would make us successful in eliminating these things in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, we are all arrogant in some level or the other. All of us. You know, and sometimes you don't even know it. You know, nobody decides to be arrogant. Nobody says, I'm going to be arrogant today. You, know, you see, it comes out from you in a certain way. It's an attitude that just bubbles up inside of you because of these, these apparent deficiencies that you perceive in yourself and this fear that you might have of other people seeing this in yourself. This is what makes our guys. Yes, salawat to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his family. Oh. 
So, so arrogance on the outward, on the inward we know arrogance is a state of the, the mind, a state of soul. But outwardly, it is uh, manifested in, a, in an aggressive way. It is one, therefore, that repels people from you. It doesn't draw people to you. It repels people from you. And so, you know, uh, it's very, very good to uh, look at the, 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 the sunnah of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the imams, how they dealt with, with, uh, with arrogant people or how they dealt with people in situations where we would become arrogant in that particular situation. You know, so for example, you have a story of Imam Hassan alayhi salam in Medina and you know, the, the man from Syria, you, I'm sure you've heard of it, the man from Syria comes into Medina and he sees Imam Hassan alayhi salam riding a horse and he's a very beautiful man, looks very noble and, and, and so forth and he admires him. And he says, who is this beautiful man who is passing by? And somebody said, he's the son of Ali and this man starts with cursing and swearing of Imam, Imam Hassan alayhi salam and so forth and so on. And Imam Hassan alayhi salam hears him and he looks at him and he smiles. And he says, you know, from how you speak, you're not from here. You, you're probably a traveler. I'm, a, I'm, your, I'm at your service. If you are tired, come to my house, have some food. You can sleep. You're our guest. And Imam Hassan alayhi salam is so nice to him. And, he, and the man goes to his house and so forth. And then the man becomes a Shia. He says, you are truly the son of the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I mention this because I tell you something. If it was me, my first response would be to curse him off just like he cursed me off. Be what, because what is this? This is that, that flame of, of, of uh, offense. How dare you speak about me like this? For example, this is arrogance. Huh? He's wrong. You see, but because it wounds your ego, you want to be angry and you respond to that person the same way. And as I tell you, it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to control your anger at people when they, as we say back home, they mess with you. You know, when they uh, insult you or whatever. It's very difficult to smile with somebody like in, in that situation, like Imam Hassan alayhi salam. You know, you have to actually, as I say, begin on the outside and come on the inside. You have to actually act. You have to act as you are humble in order to find that humility in yourself. You have to go against yourself. You have to say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to be nice to that person, even though they curse me off. And that's a tough one. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the strongest of you is not the one who can lift the heaviest rock. The strongest of you is the one who could control their anger. And this is a process. The more you do it, the easier it gets. The less you do it, the harder it gets. This is the jihad on nafs. And so we have to be always on our guard, like a soldier standing outside the camp, preventing the enemy from coming in. A sentry. You have to be always on your guard with respect to that nafs. Because we have a shaitanic type of tendency. Human beings are a combination of all of the worlds, you know. Islam believes in a multiverse. We don't believe in one universe. This universe is like almost like a, a sheet of paper. This infinite universe on its level, on its level of matter and space and time is infinite. It has no end on its level. But, but compared to the worlds above, it's like a sheet of paper. We are a multiverse. So the world of the jinn is in us. Because when we get that anger and it flares up inside, it's a flame. It makes you hot. It makes your face flush. 
You can feel your body heating up. This is your shaitani aspect. And so when you, you, you give, uh, 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 you know, uh, ijazah, if you give permission to it, it will take you over and you become a shaitan. You become, you become just like him. In fact, he doesn't even need to tempt you because now you're an automatic. You're going to be doing exactly what he would have done in your particular situation. So I, I warn you against arrogance. You want to be followers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam? We cannot do this without starting to fight against the forces of evil in ourselves. When you can fight against the forces of evil in yourself, when you can destroy that negative aspect in yourself, then you can destroy any kind of opposition that is outside of you without uh, a question. You can defeat it all. But if you cannot defeat yourself, and that's why it's called the uh, Jihad al-Akbar, because it's one thing to fight an external enemy, it's another thing to fight yourself, your very self. It reminds me of a, a very interesting story by, by Rumi, where uh, a, a, a sheikh is going through the jungle and he sees an old man riding a tiger, a huge tiger. And uh, uh, they, he asks, who is this man that is riding this tiger? And uh, he finds out where that person lives. And he goes to that, person, uh, that person's house and he finds this man uh, living with the most awful wife a man could ever have. Somebody who is always criticizing him and giving him a hard time and every day, you know. And uh, he put up with that. He, 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 he controlled his anger. And this control of his anger gave him this power to be able to tame a tiger. This is what Rumi was trying to teach us, trying to show us. And so therefore, if you could control yourself, you are able to be victorious. Remember the story of Imam Ali alayhi salam when the, the kafirs spit in his face before he was about to destroy him. What did he do? He stood up and walked away. And he paused. Then he came back and he did his job. And they asked, well, why did you stop? He spit on you. He said, yes. At that point, I was angry. At that point, I became angry. And at that point, if I did anything to this person, I would not be fighting fi I would be fighting for myself. So he controlled himself and he came back and he did his work. And so, as we mentioned before yesterday, uh, to be able to control our arrogance, sometimes it requires, it requires, like our anger and so forth, it requires a passivity. It requires us to sort of like be, care, be calm in ourselves, let that, that explosion of heat die down and come under control. And then you are able to be victorious. I don't know if you guys are into boxing, but in my generation, I grew up in a generation of Muhammad Ali. You know, he was our hero. And if any of you guys ever saw the fight between him and George Foreman, George Foreman was arrogant. George Foreman said, I'm, so I said, I'm bigger than this guy. I'm younger than him. You know, I'm going to knock this guy down. And so Ali uses this feeling against Foreman. He, he, he does the rope-a-dope. Foreman is punching him out all the time on the ropes. And every time Foreman is punching him, he's telling George, is that all you can do? George, you're punching like a girl. George, and George is getting more and more angry until he punches himself out. And he is his own enemy. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as a, a kid growing up and so on in rough neighborhoods and so forth, you know, we used to use that to our advantage. One of the things in a fight that you should never do is lose your, your, your self-control. You should never lose your self-control. And this is something that you can extend to everything in life. The moment you lose your self-control, you have lost. You've lost. So I leave you with this. Avoid self-conceit. Avoid thinking that because you know you are this or you are that, you are a sheikh, you are a, you are you are a professor, you are you are a wealthy person of whatever, that you have some kind of arrogant thing in your in your soul. No, avoid this. 
And there are certain um, uh, uh, ways that you can do this, and I just want to um, mention them uh, quickly. Uh, one of them is serving, serving people, serving your family as a way of overcoming arrogance. Another is being self-sufficient, not having too many people doing things for you. So you expect them to do, you know, for them to behave in a way that you want them to behave. Another one is uh, enduring suffering and deprivation. Because if you're suffering, if you have lost something, it's something that is supposed to make you humble. When Allah takes something away from you, many times that thing he takes away from you that is, you think is really good is something that is a source of your pride. Uh, and also, the other one is Salah. It's Salah. Allah has made uh, Iman obligatory uh, as a purification from polytheism and prayer as a means of deterring arrogance. Because when you're praying to Allah, you're supposed to be humble. If you're not humble, you cannot uh, get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give salawat to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his family. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Uh, today I just want to mention the story of uh, Muslim Ibn Awsaja, a companion of Imam Ali alayhi salam, who was nearly 80 years old. On Karbala, there are many, they represent all of us. They represent a cross-section of all of humanity. I'm not going to talk about Jaun. I think the story of Jaun is racist. And I think um, uh, it has been disproven in terms of uh, additions to uh, that story. You know, here's a black guy, a black man saying, I don't want to be black and I smell bad and things like that. There's all stereotypes. So I'm not going to talk about Jaun, but I'll talk about most Muslim in Ausaja. He's an 80 year old man. And he's one of the leading people of Kufa. And uh, Muslim knows that Imam Hussein alayhi salam needs help. He sneaks out of Kufa and he goes to join the Imam. When the Imam sees him, the Imam says, Muslim, you're 80 years old. Jihad is not wajib on you. Go back home. Muslim insists and insists he wants to fight for the Imam. He represents all old guys. He wants to fight for the Imam and the Imam lets him. Muslim goes to uh, Habib and he says to Habib, because you know when you get older, you start to bend, you know, you get more crouched. He said, bend my waist so I can stay straight. Band my waist with my turban so I can stay straight. So these guys uh, do not think that I'm too weak to fight them. Habib says, well, what about your head? Your hair is gray. He says, I want my hair to bear witness to Allah as to the uh, cruelty of these people. And he goes out there to fight. And the one soldier sees Muslim and he says, Mus uh, says uh, Muslim, and he says, Muslim, what an old guy like you is doing on the battlefield. Why don't you go home? He says to him, I, I, my home, my bed is now the, 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 the spears of Yazid. And he kills this man. This old man fought with a spiritual power and dispatched many of these soldiers until all of them ganged up upon Muslim and, and destroyed him and killed him. While Muslim is lying on the ground, bleeding, Imam Hussein alayhi salam comes up to this old man and he cradles this man's head and Muslim looks at Imam Hussein and he says, Oh, Imam, how did I fight? And the Imam said, You fought like a true follower of Ali. Muslim took the uh, Imam's hand and weakly brought it to his lips. And in the kind hands of the Imam, Muslim passed away. Assalamu alaikum, ya Aba Abdullah, wa al wahil lati halat bi fina'ik. Alaika minni salamu lahi abada ma baqeet wa baqeea laylu wa nahar. Assalamu ala al-Hussein wa ala Ali ibn al-Hussein wa ala awlaad al-Hussein wa ala ashab al-Hussein.